gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. Bless Kristen, who will read to us the scriptures. Make us hunger for the word of life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> verses 1 through 21. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. When the day of Pentecost had come, at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered. Wait, is, am I supposed to skip Pastor Keith? I, okay, I got it. I got it. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this live. And uh, <laughs> All right, let me start again. So the, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Athenians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends the reading.
So here we are on the feast day of Pentecost, one of the Christian church's three high holy days. And if you're like me, in the churches of your childhood, and perhaps even into adulthood, perhaps even recently, Pentecost may not have been high on your radar. I tend to think of myself as a Christmas person. And I know people who are Easter people, but I don't know anyone who says Pentecost is my favorite church holiday. <laughs> I can hardly wait to get some Pentecost candy from Walmart when it goes on sale tomorrow, right? I mean, we're not, we're, the larger culture also is not a Pentecost culture. When I was a child and until recently, I tended to think of the trajectory of the story, Christ comes to earth, travels around for a couple of years, they're young guys, they're walking everywhere, it's all guys, and they attract a following because people who can heal and people who can feed attract a following, and then Jesus is crucified, and then rises from the dead, and bim, bam, boom, off they go out into the world, and the world has changed, and we all become Christians. And that was sort of how it was told to me, and the whole Pentecost part of the story was left out. Now, I'm also sort of thinking that there's been another part of the story that has been left out, and I think it's a part of the story that will speak to many of us. It's only recently that I went back to the Gospels and started reading them all, in, all at once, like you would a story, as opposed to a little bit here and a little bit here, the way we get it at church. And it's curious at the end of the Gospels to see what the disciples are doing. Here they've had a couple of years going around the countryside with Jesus. Jesus has risen from the dead. And what do they do? In the end of the Gospel of John, they're out fishing. Why are they fishing? I thought they went out and they converted the whole world. And yet here they are at the end of the Gospel of John fishing. In the book of Acts, they're gathered in a room. What are they doing in that room? I thought they went out and they, and they trans transferred all this knowledge to the world and the world said, oh, thank you for enlightening us. We will all become Christians now. They are in a holding pattern and it's a holding pattern that may feel familiar to many of us. They've been waiting in a room, right? Jesus says, I gotta go. I've risen, but now I gotta go again. And I've often thought that must be quite traumatizing. Here you've lost your friend on the cross. You think he's dead. It's a horrible thing to witness. Some of them couldn't even stick around to witness it because they were in danger. They've been in danger, their friend has been crucified, their leader is gone, and then suddenly he rises again. That in itself would be a trauma. And then he's with them for a little bit, and then he 
goes away again and he says, wait right here, some, you know, I'm sending someone else to take care of you. And they wait and they wait. It feels familiar, doesn't it? Many of us have been in a similar holding pattern. We have been waiting. We may not be real sure what we're waiting for. Some of us are hoping that life goes back to normal, right? We'll go out, we'll fish some more. We know what to do. Fishing feels familiar. We used to do that. It's a family business. Our families have probably been saying, when are you gonna get back to the family business? Come help us out. What are you waiting for? Here they are, waiting in a room, waiting and waiting. Not sure what they're waiting for, not sure what they're headed towards. That may feel familiar too, right? We are not, we are a people today in, in 2021. If you're like me, you are not exactly sure what you're headed towards. You may have hopes, but you also understand the trajectory of history and you know that when people have gone through a collective trauma, like the one we have gone through, and frankly, the one we are still going through, because we are not done with our trauma. Not everybody is back to full employment. Not everybody is back to full health. We have not had a chance to process our loss and grieve our loss and move towards something new. A lot of us have not. We are not in a going towards the new kind of frame of mind. And I suspect the disciples were the same way in that room, right? Okay, Jesus told us to wait and hang out here. Okay, who's going to cook breakfast this morning? They probably got lost or focused in the sort of day-to-day, -day, how do we get through the day? Even though Christ is risen, I think it's important to remember that they have undergone quite a trauma. And that's what I come back to again and again. And traumatized people don't snap back immediately. I think it's important to remember that they've been doing mission work as they've traveled with Jesus, right? They've been healing. They've been feeding. Um, they know what to do. They have a vision of what Jesus was about, and yet they don't immediately, after Jesus says, I have to go, they don't say, well, we've got a mission. We were shown what to do. Let's go out and do it. It is not until the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit is what makes it possible to go bigger. The Holy Spirit is what gives them the vision to go out into the world and form these new Christian communities. It is the Holy Spirit that gives them the courage to do this. Because this is not a welcome message in most places. You may be familiar with this, right? When you go to people and you say, hey, you've been doing it wrong, but I'm here to help. I'm here to give you a transforming vision. It's rare that people say, oh, goody, we've been waiting for you to come and give us your transforming vision, right? They go from town to town. They speak the word. Some people hang out and believe. Some people stay put and do the transforming work. The disciples keep moving, right? It's the book of Acts, as I have said before, not the book of sitting around waiting for stuff to happen. I also think it's important to think about those communities that are founded, um, because I think that a lot of us, we are not Pentecost people because it sounds like it takes a lot of energy, doesn't it? You know, you may be like me saying, Holy Spirit, I'm ready for a new vision, but first I would like a nap, a very, very long nap. And then maybe we can talk about this vision that you have. I think, too, that it's important to remember that the act of taking a nap can be part of the transforming of the world that the Holy Spirit has in mind. I think it's important to remember that Jesus had downtime and we're allowed to have downtime, too. I think that it's important to remember that the word of Christ gets out to people in part because of these disciples, but in part because of the communities that are founded that stay put to do the work. If you go back and you read between the lines of the gospel and you look for the sentence here and the sentence there about who is doing the work, you will find that it is people who have money who fund the work, it is people who have 
roots in the community who give the disciples the introduction that they need to the people that they need who will hear the word, who will hear the transformational promise. It is people who are already part of the community who are doing the feeding, doing the cleaning, doing the clothing, doing the care work that make the gospel take root in those communities. The disciples come, they deliver the message, and off they go again. For some of us, that's the kind of work we are called to do. And I'm not here to denigrate that kind of work. But I know that for some of us, we are already pretty rooted in our communities, right? We've got children, we've got commitments, we've got aging parents who need us going out two by two, taking very little with us, trusting on the bounty that we will find there or that we won't find there, and that will be a message that tells us to keep going. That may not be what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. And I think that the Pentecost message can be a broader message about what it takes to transform the world. It's not just going out and delivering the message. It's not just taking the seeds out to new places, but it's also being the community that cares for the seeds, that takes care of the little seedlings, that gives the words of the Holy Spirit a place to take root and to blossom and to grow. And I mention this because I think that we are entering a period in human history where we have the possibility for great transformation. And my hope is that it will be a really wonderful transformation because I think we also have the potential for a very negative transformation. But today it's Pentecost. And so today I would encourage us to think about what that transformation would look like. We are part of a religious community and we believe and we say week after week that God is inviting us to be part of the inbreaking kingdom of God. We're not just here working to get our meal ticket into heaven later. That'll be really nice, but God is calling us to transform the world right here and now into the kingdom of God. How would we do that, and what does it look like? And you may be sitting there saying, don't bother me with this. I would just like to find a pair of pants that fit, and I do not care about the inbreaking kingdom of God. And I would encourage us to listen for the Holy Spirit who says, I envision a, a place where everybody has a pair of pants that fit. And we can make that happen. We can clothe everybody. We have shoes for their tired feet. We can give them a nice, safe place to nap. And we can give them some tea and some cookies when they wake up and fortify them for the work ahead. The, God is calling us to a much bigger dream and a much bigger vision than we can dream alone. We do it in part when we are here together in community. We do it in part when we are taking a nap and God comes to us in those dreams and visions that we have when we're taking a nap. We do it in part because we have yearnings. And that is one way that God is speaking to us, in the yearnings that we have, to the world that we would like to live in. We are at a hinge moment in history a Pentecost moment in history. So let us, let us take the time we need to recover from the trauma that we have suffered and are suffering. Let us pray that God brings us the comfort that is promised as we are healing from this trauma. Let us commit to have an openness to the visions that God is giving us, the yearnings that God is giving us for the way that the world could be better. Let us be open to the energy that God has promised to give us. Let us continue to pray that we will have the energy that the vision requires. Let us pray that God will sustain us to see these visions to completion to train the people coming behind us as well, because we are sort of like those medieval cathedral builders. We may not see it built in our lifetime, but we can contribute, and we can train the next generation, and we can keep moving 
towards that vision that God has, that vision of the kingdom of God that looks like the most fabulous get-together you've ever had. For some of us, that's a one-on-one -on -one get together. For some of us, it might be alone time. Maybe it's a giant quilting bee. Maybe it's gathering together to watch sports together and, and to have the best food that somebody else made and someone else is gonna clean up. Um, whatever that vision of God's party looks like to you, let us begin today to dream it. Let us begin today to move towards that vision.
the devil and all his empty promises? I do. And do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God? Believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of our life. Amen. You've made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? To live among God's faithful people, to hear his word and share in his supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people, following the example of our Lord Jesus, and to strive for justice in all the earth. Gracious Lord, through the water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us your own. You forgave us all our sins and brought us to newness of life. Continue to strengthen us with your Holy Spirit and daily increase in us your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. 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 Lord, we come before you today, and we thank you for all you've given us, Lord, and we pray for every, everyone who needs prayer, Lord. We pray especially continued prayers for Nakia's mom, Ms. Gibbons, as she <clears throat> is home recovering from her illness. We pray continued prayers for Denise and Brittany, for, that they succeed in their new roles at work. Pray strength and prayer for Alfonso Rodrigo Amegal's family as they prepare to lay him to rest. For all teachers, kids, and staff at Pembroke Pines Charter School and all the schools in Broward County. We pray for all our TLC family members and their friends. Everyone looking for employment for those who don't have a church home to pray for them. We pray for all God's animals, big and small, for all God's children. We pray for strength and healing for Fran Brown as she prepares for chemo treatment next week. We pray for Robert as he deals with his new chapter in his life, for all those who are homeless and without a place to call home. Lord, we lift up everyone who does not have food to eat, <clears throat> everyone we work for and with. We pray continued prayers for James as he heals, deals with work challenges and health challenges. We pray for all who in need in Tel Aviv, Israel, Gaza, for healing and strength for all of us. Lord, we pray for Sally and Skeeter, we pray for Diane, Grace Ann with cancer, for Betty, Ann, David, 
Kayla, and Caitlin. We pray for Anne, Bonnie, and family. Lord, we pray for Bonnie, Kathy, Sonny, David, Ryan, and Stacy. Lord, we lift up Ed, the Brassard family, for Gavin and his family. Lord, we pray for Joe DiMaggio's babies and their families. We pray for Ray, Dawn, Mackenzie. We lift up Matthew, Rodney, Vera, Lisa M, Jose, and Betty. Lord, we pray for Mickey, Diana, Valerie, Linda B, and family. Lord, we lift up Elizabeth and Randall for Cecilia in the hospital with COVID. Lord, we pray for Amanda and Drew, Matthew and Nicole, for Kerry and Patrick, Elizabeth and Kayla, for Jose Sr., Jonathan and Tanya. We lift up Cruz, Ava, Everett, and Miles, for Karen, Lisa, Danny, Keely. We pray for Barbara and Vera. We pray for Donna, for Kathy and Jim, and for Noah and Amanda. Lord, we lift up all who need prayer, those in our hearts and on our lips. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue to commune using the communion packets for the time being. Lisa's going to come up and distribute the packets as we progress into the Holy Communion portion of our service. We'll give instructions and we'll all walk through communion together. Lisa.
our hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, right our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you poured out the fire of your Spirit, uniting one body, one people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and the sea and all their creatures, with the angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn.
sell the thing from the top, it will, <coughs> you'll be able to remove the wafer. If you see anyone who needs help nearby, please lend them assistance. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. You'll find it's easier to remove the purple if you just slowly work your way around rather than trying to do it all at once. You're also less likely to spill it. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Amen. I invite all who are able to please rise. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of heaven to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to Christ's resurrection, that we may show forth your glory to all the world. <clears throat> Through the same Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we survived our first service with bulletins in 14 months. Yay! We continue to worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and live stream as we wrestle with the new, the new dual cam uh, camera setup. And um, just... We continue to mail the newsletter to those that need it mailed and email it to those who receive it by email. If you're not receiving it either by email or mail, let us know your preference and we'll uh, take care of you. The drive up communion is only going to continue for this Sunday and next, and then we're going to go ahead and close that ministry out as we moved up with worship and invite people to come here as they are able. Beloved in the Lord, God has shown us what is good and what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Amen. If you, if you receive the newsletter <laughs> as speaking of justice, at the celebration for ball justice that was held last week, Trinity Lutheran, as a result of our work for the past year and at the action, was recognized for having the highest percentage of its average worship attendance turn out for the action at 166%. <laughs> that trophy another year because we had it from the year before because you guys are awesome. <laughs> and because of the combination of our, our dedication financially to bold justice mm -hmm. and our turnout to the action and the number of people we had who brought three people to the action, we won another award. We also had the highest year of our turnout to the action ever in the past 13 years. Woo! I just keep going. It was, it was a bold justice kind of year for the congregation. But go ahead and look at the newsletter and see all the, the wonderful ways in which this congregation and its extended community turned out for justice 
and we'll be hearing a bit later on uh, in our worship year as we follow up for those victories won. But they, they're very meaningful, uh, what it means that we receive commitments to help keep nonviolent offenders out of jail and give them both adults and young people a second chance. What it means that our assisted living facilities are now being uh, inspected and watched and have generators with the storm season coming up that we can avoid tragedies as we saw a few years back. These are important things. And if bold justice wasn't doing the work it does, if you weren't being a part of that and turning out for the action, these things would not have happened. Think about that. They would not have happened. And now uh, we're continuing to work uh, with our county commissioners to, to get their commitment to build housing uh, for the, the homeless that, that have mental challenges to give them a roof over their head and some stability in their lives. So we continue to pray for those people who are keeping the foot on the gas to try to get them to, to commit those dollars to do that. Because if bold justice wasn't doing that, it would not be done. This is our shared work, this congregation and 25 other synagogues and congregations throughout Broward County. This is what it means when we turn out 166% of our worship attendance. It shows those folks in power that, that this is holy work and that we won't back down. So thank you, my friends. Those, all those awards do is acknowledge your hard work and dedication and your commitment to God's work of justice. So thank you. And the perfect hymn following that would be. <laughs>